So, as I've said, today's talk is on data structures, and we'll go ahead and begin. Cool. So, hi everyone. Enhance. Cool. <laughs> My name is Michael Starch. I'm an engineer in the local area. As a matter of fact, I work up at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And today we're going to be talking about data structures. Again, this is an overview. I love questions. I may not be able to answer every single question you have in the middle of the presentation, but I encourage you to ask and I'll tell you if we should discuss it offline, because some questions take a little bit longer. So, without a lot of... This is kind of the agenda of our talk today. We're going to talk a little bit about data structures, then we're going to go move into a little bit about Python and some pointers and other basic information on how to get ready to conceptualize data structures, and then we're just going to go through a whole bunch of different types and talk about them. They're exciting, they're fun. Again, I encourage questions. So, let's talk a little bit about data. You have data, right? As I said in the abstract, I think this black hole picture used, what was it, 55 petabytes of data, which is more bytes than I can pronounce the English numeral for, but it's like many zeros. All of that data needs to be organized, right? You can't just have data in some giant pool, well, actually you could, but it's less useful than if you have it in a nice structure. So the idea behind data structures is, how can we organize our data so that it's efficient for the ways we need to access it, and our programs can run faster, we can have concurrency, we can have usability features, so your code isn't thousands of miles long when one line will do. And then we'll talk a little bit about complexity and computational time. In data structures, the paradigm generally goes, you can have a time efficient data structure or a space efficient data structure. That is, you can use a small memory footprint or a small amount of computational time, and they're generally trade-offs. And then just to make things more com complicated, complexity adds a third dimension to it. The more efficient you try to make your data structures, the harder it is to rationalize and think about them. So that's kind of the idea of what data structures are, and we're going to go here briefly to Python. So I chose Python because I assume most of you know Python or know a little bit about it, or you've seen some dynamic programming language that looks kind of like this. Here you've got some data, I've got a list, I've got a map, or in Python they're called dictionaries, and I've got an immutable, which happens to be a tuple here. It's kind of your basic data structures, but you don't really think about them when you're writing dynamic programming. What implements this list? I don't know. How do I make it faster? I don't know. This was a big problem I ran into at work the other day, is I was trying to copy thousands of buffers out of a file and concatenating them into one big list to process, and the thing took a minute and a half to run. A minute and a half to run may not seem that bad, but when you're just processing a single text file, you're like, really? I don't have a minute and a half to sit here. It's not long enough for me to get coffee, and it is not short enough for me to have the patience to let it run. So then I spent hours and hours trying to dig into the bowels and figure out what was going on so that I could speed up my lists. I never got an answer, because then I got pulled off that project and it was on other <laughs> things. But someday I will have to go fix that problem, or I will get yelled at, why is your program taking so long to run? And I'll be like, it was the interns, they did it. <laughs> right? I always blame the intern. Right. So another big gotcha in Python is this dictionary we have here. This dictionary is wonderful. What if you want to iterate through the keys? What's the order? Eventually you start wondering how these things work. And Python is really good at making it easy, not great about making it understandable in a way that you can easily relate to. So the answer is, you can't really tell what the order of the keys are unless you use a special data type called order dictionary. We're not gonna talk about that today because that's a Python thing, but if you have questions about it, we can talk about it later in the talk. And then of course there's an immutable, and the only reason I threw that in is some data structures are immutable, like land strings or my tuple, and you can't change them, although you can sometimes change the references to them. So this is Python. It's supposed to give us a foundation for discussion. It shows you how to create data structures that are easy, but not necessarily data structures that are um, understandable. And my computer is just going to keep trying to go to sleep all day. So, moving on. Put the cursor in lower way. Um, that will lock the screen because I have it designed to go. I can put it up here. 
the other corner. But normally one corner is locked the screen, the other corner is don't just leave it. I, I've only configured to lock the screen because uh, this is my work computer. Okay. So what do we do about these Python things? Well, we need some foundational knowledge first. How many of you know what a pointer is? Okay, a few of you. More importantly, how many of you don't know what a pointer is? Okay, great. So a pointer is nothing but an address in memory. That's all it is. So here we have a pointer that says, I'm pointing at an integer, just like your address points at your house. That's as deep as I want to get into it. The pointer just points at some region of memory. So it points at something that exists in memory. There's a whole lot of more nuances to pointers that make them efficient. But for today's talk, we just need to know, pointers point at something else in memory. Just like this address is pointing at a house, but it could point at your mansion or somebody else's house. So, classes. How many of you know classes? A few more of you, not everyone. So, a class is basically a composition type. It allows you to take two data types and combine them into one. So here we have an integer, and we have that nice pointer we just talked about, and we said they are one type. So you can pass it around, it acts like a variable, but it has different subtypes inside. In this case, a value and a pointer. That's about as far deep as I want to get to into C and C++ land for the purposes of this conversation. Yes, you had a question? I, I was just wondering what language we're in, but yeah, C++, okay. Um, kind of. This is quasi-C++. I wrote it in Python to get the code highlighting, and then I started changing it so it looked like C. So this is some weird pseudo-language that's somewhere between Python and C++. Great. So, next. The first set of data structures we should talk about are lists, queues, and stacks. They're the most basic. They're ordered groups of data. That's all they are. I'm sure you've used lists in Python but you may not know how they're implemented. So this is a list. I've given you the implementation for the most basic list in the world called a linked list. It's a series of nodes in memory that have two things, a value and a pointer. The pointer points to the next guy. So you can quickly construct a list by creating your object, linking on another one, linking on another one, linking on another one, and then if you want to traverse, you say, here's my node, find the pointer. Here's my node, find the pointer, etc." Right? It just creates a little snake in memory that may bounce around everywhere, but it's ordered, right? No pointer points to the next one, points to the next one, and you start at the head of the list and you can walk through. Now some of you are right away saying, well this is kind of inefficient, because how do I get the last element easily? Well, with this style list, you just have to go all the way to the end, and when you encounter a pointer that points to nothing, that's the end. However, you can have a doubly linked list that goes backwards. So now you have two pointers, one pointing down the list and one pointing up the list, so reverses and searches are a little bit easier. So these are your classic lists. They're there just to capture order data. They don't really care about efficiency. They don't really care about reading a block out of memory and trying to keep it all aligned. They're just there to say, we have something in order, right? Your ducks are in a row. And then of course, there are some other variants that we can talk about. Array lists, trying to say, well, our ducks are in a row and they're also crammed into a small block of memory so that if you needed to, you could treat them like an array and not have to worry about this little search thing because they're all consecutive in memory. We have queues, which we'll talk about in a bit. We have vectors, which are kind of the same thing as array lists. And again, apparently we have queues and stacks again because I have a repetition in the slide. So, FIFOs, first in, first out. These are queues. So it's just like your list before, but we have a new paradigm. You have new items always go onto the back, consumed items always come off the front. It's a line. How many of you have been to McDonald's or some other place where you have to wait in line? I'm assuming everybody has waited in line because I've heard the meaning of life is literally just waiting in line. If you go across the street to 85 Degrees C Bakery, you will wait in line. If you go try to pay your taxes at the DMV, well, first of all, you're in the wrong place, and second of all, you will wait in line. That's what a queue is. A queue is a way of taking your data objects, especially messages, and ordering them in line and hitting them one after the other. First in, first out. The 
The first message to arrive is the first message process. So it's a way of buffering things in order that you guarantee will be processed in that order. So it's a refinement of our original list, which is just ordering things, to say, now we're going to add new, ends to, uh, new items to the end, and we're going to consume items from the front. That's a cue. These are used all the time in operating systems and message passing, because hey, you can have this little buffer that grows, and then shrinks, and then grows, and then shrinks as you generate too many messages too quickly or you process too many messages too quickly. So if I'm trying to throw you know, tennis balls to land over there, I can throw one, I can throw one, I can throw one, eventually she's gonna drop them all because I'm throwing them too fast. If she had a queue, they would just line up and wait for her to pick up each one and toss it back to me. So that's where queues have their biggest um, usefulness is messaging. Another thing to think about with queues is concurrency. Since you have one section of the queue that is adding items, and one section of the queue that's con uh, consuming items, you can actually get pretty efficient concurrency because one thread is dealing with this, one thread is dealing with this, and there's a queue between them. How many of you know what concurrency is? I realized we didn't cover that in foundational knowledge. So concurrency is where you have two threads, that's two lines of execution, operating at the same time. Okay. Getting to that. So, you have your, your computer program. It's a single piece of code. It runs from top to bottom. Now, if you're running two programs at once, because you have multiple cores, or a good operating system, you can actually have two lines of execution at once. A thread or a process are two different ways of doing that. Threads are all within one program. Processes are multiple things you run on your computer, like your browser and your email program running at the same time. Both are concurrent, both require concurrency metrics to keep them apart. Queues are good ways of doing that because queues can easily be made concurrent since they have two separate spots that are being operated on as opposed to trying to insert and read things from the same point, which is our next data structure. And also one of my favorites, stacks. Last in, first out. So the idea behind a stack is you put something down, the next one goes on top of it. The next goes on top of it. The next goes on top of it. And then when you're ready to process, you pop that one off, you pop this one off, you pop this one off. It's a child stacking blocks, right? If you stack your blocks on the ground, you get this nice little structure. If you put the blocks away, you take them off the top. If you take the one at the bottom, everything falls apart. So a stack is just creating this growing object, or this growing structure and memory that then shrinks when you read it. This is used quite often for function calls. So for those of you who are used to making function calls, you have a function frame up here that represents the function you're in. When you make a call, you add a frame on top. This is the new function. When you return, you take that one back off and now you're in the original function. So you can call as many functions as you'd like deep and you unwind them via return calls all the way back to the beginning. That's a stack. It's really efficient for doing these things that you go in and then unwind. Think undos, think function calls, think the heap in memory, which we can talk about offline if you're curious. So, that was our discussion of ordered memory structures. They have some order to them, they use pointers to get between the nodes, and they have different benefits. Before I go ramming right on through maps, are there any questions? Why is this stack your favorite? Why is this stack my favorite? I don't know, I really don't. My Reminds me of childhood. It's yes. nostalgic. Yeah, it's not bad. Like I think it's because everybody <laughs> likes cues. They're like, they're ordered, they can go in order, they can keep our messages separate, you process things in the order you got. And I'm like, nah, the most recent message to come in should be the one you're handling. <laughs> and that's a stack. It's hard to make concurrent, but it's really good at doing these operations that have scoping, right? The deeper you get, it's easy to unwind. Yeah. So that's why it's one of my favorites. I'm not saying it is my favorite, because I have a new favorite that I've discovered a few weeks mm. ago. So we'll get to that. Any other questions? Does recursion deal with the stack as well? I mean, the same notion? Or is that something more complex? The recursion is an algorithm. So it's a recursive call of the same function, but you're using the stack underneath. So you have your function, you call it again, you have, it's the same function, but it's a different frame, a new frame. Because if you call five recursive calls deep, you need to be able to unwind five recursive calls. 
So recursion or stacks are what underlying your computer program power your recursive calls. That's how they work. Recursion is also another place where you might want to look into stack data structures to say store memory as you recurse through. So have a data structure that traces your functions. You can also have the data structure that holds the data as you call deeper and deeper. Does it make sense? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Even in real life, it seems like to me like conversations are a great example of a stack. <clears throat> as you, if you go off to a different topic, like you might see, I sometimes I say in conversation, wait, let's pop off the stack, let's go back to like the previous topic we've been finished discussing. Right. Hmm. Any other questions? All right, onward to maps. So maps hold indexed data. They're key value stores. So in Python, they're called dictionaries. In Java, they're called maps. In my C++ class, we called them maps, but in C++, you can name them whatever you want. The idea is you have a key, and you want it to result in a value, right? So I have customer record one. Please pull up my customer record, right? My name is Michael Starge. Please pull up my tax information. Maybe not here, but maybe at the address. <laughs> you have some key, and you want to get the right value back at. So this is your basic map. You have a series of keys, you have a series of values, your key comes in, you check the first one, nope, check the second one, nope, check the third one, it matches, there's our value, and it's the blue box. Maps are pretty simple from a conceptual standpoint. They're just returning key values, and the easiest way to implement one is a list that holds your keys, and you go through and compare with each key, and then you return the value that is pointed to. So you have two pointers, one that's down the key list and one that goes across to the value. However, that's terribly inefficient. So we need better, more efficient maps, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Its variant that everyone talks about, so I'm going to talk about it today, is the hash map, which is our next data structure. The hash map says that previous piece is really terrible because you have to go through each conceivable record and check to see if our key matches. So you've not only got to search through a list, but then a pointer in direction. So a hash map just says, okay, arrays are super efficient because in an array, you just go to the index. If it's index zero, here. If it's index five, here. You don't have to go, is it zero? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Is it five? No, you just go straight to the fifth record. So a hash map takes that key calculates a hash function on it, which results in essentially an index into your array. So if your key comes in and your hash map says you're in index zero, uh, one, you jump right here, okay? And then you move across to get your value. So in this case, since hash map is taking a key and compressing it to something small, like an <coughs> index into an array, you need a list over here in your values that actually get you where you're looking for. So now, instead of in this map, where we were searching through four items, right? Or sorry, three items. Here, we jump to this index and we only have to search through two. So at the low scale, hash maps are terrible because you have this big potential cost of computing a hash function, computing the result of a hash function, and you have this array to iterate through. You're like, it's the same thing. But imagine a billion entries. In this case, you are touching a billion keys and comparing a billion keys to look for what you're looking for. In this case, you're comparing one key and then possibly maybe two or three others as you search through this much smaller list. The only reason this is a list here and not an actual value is you can have collisions. So you can hash one thing, hash two things, and get the same index. So they go into a list. But most often, you hash two things and you don't have collisions. So your list here is usually one, maybe two items long. So you have a direct jump and then a one or two item long list to search through as opposed to a list of a billion things and then just the value. Does that make sense? So hash maps are a way of taking that upfront cost of searching through every key and saying we can do math and jump to the key immediately, okay? So that's how they save space. So these. Hash maps are really good for quick indexing when you have many, 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 many records. If your map is going to store two records, a hash map is probably overkill. 
but I'm guessing on the internals, Python is probably using a hash map behind the dictionaries anyway, because most people don't like to write dictionaries and change types when you grow past a certain point. So everybody just implements the hash map and hides it under the dictionary function, and nobody knows they're using hash maps. But now you know why we use hash maps, because you can take that upfront cost of searching for the key and compress it into a simple mathematical call and a very short list search. Any questions on maps? Yes, go ahead. Um, for hash maps, I was just thinking, does it ever make sense, or does anyone ever try to rebalance a hash map, or do you see you have a lot of collisions? Are there multiple hashing functions to choose from to try to rebalance it as you go less collisions? Most of the effort when you're building a hash map goes into defining a hash function that doesn't collide very often. Your goal is to pick one function that works really well, and have a minimal number of collisions come out. The other thing that you have to think about in hash space, which I wasn't planning on covering, but we can. How long is this array? If you have one array to store your keys, one element array, then every hash function you compute must collide. Because this guy's gonna map here, this guy's gonna map here, this guy's gonna map here, and then you just have a list that you're searching through. That's worst case. If you have 100 billion records in your array, this hash map can pick any one of those 100 billion functions, which is great, but you're gonna have a lot of wasted space, especially if you only put two entries in, and you have a billion records in memory, it's still super fast to search, but you have all this wasted memory because you've been hashing, and you have this output space of your hash function that has to map to an individual record. So where I see rebalancing done in hash maps is not so much do we change the hash function, but we start with this much space in our array output, and then if we grow to a certain number of size, we increase that so that you can take advantage of a smaller, um, what would this be, a smaller range, sorry, a smaller domain on the output of your hash function when you have a few number of records, and when you grow to a large number of records, you increase your domain size so that you have fewer collisions. So it's about, not so much about your hash function, but about the output, how much space you use in memory to store this map. Because each hash output has its own entry in memory to represent its output in the most basic of hash map implementations. Yes, go ahead. Related to what you're already talking about. In this diagram, uh, there are collisions here, is that true? Yes, okay, each like, of these yeah. lists is a collision. Right. If we didn't have a collision, this list would only be one long. Are collisions desired for, I mean, that's part of the design, what hash, hashing is you, the collisions will have for more efficient storage so or retrieval? Your goal when designing a hash map is to avoid collisions because okay. you don't want to walk this list. Okay. The goal of a hash map is to have lightning fast access to your records. So you want a hash map that has as few collisions as possible. In an ideal situation, you have this, okay. right? However, you must recognize that collisions are always possible, so you have these lists rather than single entries, so that if you get a collision in the one out of one million times that you get a collision, you have both records and you don't lose data. Your hash can be something really simple, like just adding the value, ASCII value of every letter in your key, or XORing it. Or, it's a digest of some sort. Or adding them up to be a 32-bit integer or something like that. You're going to have duplicates. Why is that indexing? That results in quicker indexing as you have much. Right, right, right. Because here, the output of the hash function says, oh, it's at the third index. So rather than walking down and checking every node with the string equals, is this my key, is this my oh. key, you just jump here. You know that's your key, and then you at most have one, maybe two entries to check rather than 10 or 15 or a billion. You There's can't much, much much array. The, in, the index up on the array, and now you've got a, you've got a value. So, remember this map. Here it's For uh, each key, yeah. it's a comparison. 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 Ah, I got it. Here. Right? And so if you had a billion records and you're going for the last one, it'd be a billion comparisons. Right. Where in the hash map, it's probably one computation for the hash function that says go to the billionth record and probably one comparison because your list most likely does not have a collision. Okay. So it's like three comparisons as opposed to a billion. Much more efficient at the large scale, not so great at the small scale, but most of us are kind of in the medium realm where it's okay to use the hash map. 
Are you familiar with the term buckets? Sometimes there's signs of the, when they're talking about hashing, yeah. they refer to buckets. Now, is that, have those collisions or no? Yes. The red is your buckets, right? Okay. Here's a bucket, the bucket holds a list. So the reason we have buckets is because that's the output of your hash function, right? You have to have n number of buckets. So here we have four buckets, right? That's four possible outputs of our hash function. That's fine, but we need those buckets to contain lists because you could collide. In an ideal hash map, you'd have four buckets and each bucket would hold one item, but that's not the real world. So you need the ability to have a bucket that has multiple items in it that you search through. But again, every bucket will have a smaller number than the total, which means much less searching. Any other questions? Thank you for asking these. These have clarified the explanation considerably. Go ahead. It's, uh, well, I have a, a comment. But, uh, yeah, but sure. As uh, far as uh, where I learned about uh, maps is a talk from uh, Raymond Henninger. He does a really good talk uh, at, uh, using Python, but the, I mean, the concepts are the same, uh, breaking down of like how Python has gone over the years, iterating over different implementations and how they've ended up where they are today. He goes way back even before Python on how implementations of these kind of things have gone. I'll post a link to uh, his PyCon talk in the uh, Slack channel. Cool. So he's going to give you some more information on maps and how to implement them. I didn't want to dive too deep into the implementation of these data structures because our goal is to learn about a whole bunch so that we know kind of what to apply. And if you need to, you can search for the implementations <coughs> later. But if you're using something with a large standard library like Java or Python, your implementation probably exists. Java has a hash map. They also have a linked list hash map, which has both. It has links going through these values as well as hashing. They have like 100 different maps. It's wonderful. The key takeaway here is hash maps take a lot of space because you're not guaranteed to have a bucket that's full. Your bucket might have zero and you're still wasting that space. But the trade-off is you get to your value much, much quicker in, on, at the large end. The more collisions you have, the longer it takes to get to your value, but it's still better than searching through the entire map looking for a value. Great. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're gonna talk about trees and graphs. Cool. So trees are essentially hierarchical data. They're a parent node that has some children. Those children may also have children. Those children may also have children, and on and so forth. So you're used to these. They're the document object model in uh, JavaScript. Sorry, not JavaScript. In HTML or XML, you parse them with a document object model. It's a tree, right? You have a root node, which has children nodes, which have children nodes, right? It's your body, and then your division, and then your paragraph, and then your text, right? Mm -hmm. It's also the directory structure on your computer. At least most standard directory structures are organized like a tree. You have sl root, slash, or C colon, and then you have a subfolder, Windows, and then a subfolder under that, System32, and then a file under that, um, on-screen keyboard. Kernel32 at the Yeah, sure. Don't delete that one. <laughs> so that's your tree. It's a hierarchical data structure. We have several different types of trees that we can talk about. We will talk about these two, which are binary trees and balanced trees. And there are like 10,000 other types of trees out there that I encourage you to look at. But for today, we're going to jump into the binary tree. So a binary tree is a special subset of trees that have two children only. So one node may have up to two children, which may have up to two children, which may have up to two children, etc. You can have as many deep as you'd like, but always one or two children. Why is that a good thing? Anybody? How many of you have heard of the binary search? All right, some of you. The binary search says we're going to take a problem and cut it in half. Pick the half that our answer is in, then go to that half and cut it in half. Pick the half that the answer is in, cut it in half, etc. So it's a way of taking a problem, and rather than searching the entire answer space, we keep cutting the answer space in half until we have our answer. That is a binary tree, right? Which half? This one. Which half? This one. Done. Right? That's the true advantage of a binary tree, is it is made for the binary search. It makes binary search super, super, super fast. 
So that's why I decided to bring up binary trees today. I know it doesn't directly map to your data structure or to your DOM, but it maps to that algorithm that we all kind of know because it's one of those really computer science-y things. So as we talk about algorithms, it will likely come up that we talk about binary search, and a tree is a great representation of binary search because it immediately cuts the problem in half. And as you insert elements, they can only go in one of two slots. So they're automatically hand-tailored to the binary search. Now, what is the worst case of a tree? It's all lopsided. Right. You could have one node that only has a left child, 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 and then you have a tilted list, right? Imagine the rest of this doesn't exist. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Balanced B tree. Right. So now we're moving into balanced trees. Oh, no, we didn't talk about balanced trees. Okay, well, we'll discuss it here. A balanced tree is nothing more than a normal tree that when you insert items into it, you run an algorithm to rebalance it. So you won't get this long lopsided list that goes off to one side. If you put it in a, a node and the tree says, hey, this is unbalanced, we will reorder the nodes until you have a nice balanced tree like the one you see before you. Does that make sense? So if I were to go insert a node here and then insert another node here, it would rebalance, pull this guy down, pop the one up, and now you'd have a nice balanced tree. I'm not gonna get into the deep complexities of how to rebalance a tree efficiently because that's a really hard problem and it's pretty well thought out through in textbooks and online. But I wanted to bring up this concept of balanced trees so that when you're out there and you're thinking, I need to do a binary search algorithm, but I might have all of my data just constantly going left, you know, I should use a balanced tree because it will rebalance if it gets too out of whack and keep my searches as efficient as possible. Because a binary search is great, but a balanced binary search is as fast as a binary search can go. Any questions before we leave trees? Yes, go ahead. I haven't really worked with trees in other languages besides Java where I did it you know, in school, like we did it all from the ground up. But when you're working with trees in languages like Python, do they have balanced versions that balance themselves? The one time I've used trees professionally was with the Java libraries and the Java libraries didn't have great tree support because by the time you're getting to trees you're off into deep algorithmic space so yes they generally come in standard variants balanced trees red black trees etc however you don't see them often in the standard uh, dictionaries or sorry the standard libraries like Python might provide or Java might provide but often you find them in the extra libraries you know, the things like C++ has Boost, right? It's not the standard library, but it's a library that just about everybody uses. Java has not just the standard library, but a bunch of like extra things from Apache that you can pull in. That's where I most often see extra data structures like trees, because you're getting into a realm that most standard library designers are like, this is too much, nobody uses them. And so when you need them, I often go off to the Apache Commons or whatever library is there for that language to find better implementations. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I've had to use trees all at once in my professional career because if you're doing this, you're kind of an algorithms researcher and that's a lot different from my job, which is a computer engineer. However, like I said, where I would look is not necessarily in the standard library. Might be there, you might get lucky, but most of the time you're looking at that extra library that the community has maintained where everybody says, oh yeah, we all just import Apache comments because that's what everybody does, right? That's where I tend to find better data structures like this. Java has a tree map, right? Yeah, yeah I've always viewed that as more <laughs> of a map and less of a tree, but you're right, it does have a tree map. Java is a wonderful standard library. They have every conceivable data structure that I've ever thought of and many that I hadn't. They have concurrent versions of a lot of data structures. They have data structures that have multiple different paradigms, like a linked list and a hash map in one, so that you get the efficiencies of both with a little added complexity. But the key is they wrote that complexity, so you don't have to deal with it, you just import it and run it. They also have very nice interfaces that go over top of all of your data structures, so you can say, I need a map. I want to hand off a map. But you can implement it with a concurrent linked uh, hash map. And everybody just sees it as a map, but you get the efficiency baked in from the subclass. 
we could go into a lot of depth in the Java library, but I'd rather jump onto graphs because graphs are the new hot thing in computer science. Hooray! <laughs> graphs are a bunch of nodes that can just kind of arbitrarily point at one another. <laughs> so here's your graph. You have a node which points to another node, which points to another node, which points to another node, and you have this nice little graph thing, right? It's what you think of when you think of a map of cities, for example, right? Toledo is up here, Los Angeles is down here, New York is over here, and I don't know, London is <coughs> over here, right? You have a graph of the travel roads between them. It's called the flight patterns from they're United. All, they're all one-way streets. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Graphs don't have to be one way. I've, drew, uh, I've drawn this graph with uh, single directional arrows, but that's not a requirement. Neither is direction at all. Your graphs do not have to have direction. They can just have links, right? Imagine your friend group on Facebook. It's a graph. That's why graphs are so popular. I'm friends with Carlos. Carlos is friends with Tommy. Tommy is friends with Jess, for example. Jess is friends with me. Nice graph, right? You can have any friends you want. Those aren't directional links. If I'm friends with Carlos, Carlos is also friends with me, right? Now, I don't really use Facebook, so don't go out there and expect this friend graph to be out there. But the reason graphs are so hot is exactly this. Social networking is all the hot thing, and social networks are graphs. Also, network topologies are graphs, and travel routes are graphs, and all sorts of things. Right? I was just going to say that, yeah, Facebook's main API is a graph API. Right. They call it graph themselves. Now, the reason I bring up graphs as the new hot thing is a lot of research is being done on how can we analyze graphs, how can we analyze large graphs, like what they have in Facebook, and how can we do that in parallel. This is Apache Sparks graph library, all the machine learning graph-based libraries, all of this stuff. I don't have time to get into that today, but this is the basic concept of what's underpinning all of that. It's nodes that have arbitrary connections between one another. And for those of you who love computer science, this is the traveling salesman problem. Now, there's one thing you should notice about this graph that should make everybody who knows what a graph is cringe. What is that? Anyone? <coughs> it has a cycle. Oh, wait, maybe it doesn't have a cycle. <laughs> yes, it does. There's my cycle. I knew I put one in there. Oh, wait, that arrow is backwards. Hmm, maybe it doesn't have a cycle. Almost. Good for not cringing. So, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Graphs can have cycles in it, which means this graph points to here, points to here, points to here. I got that arrow backwards, right? If that arrow were going up, we have a nice cycle in there. Cycles are really nasty for a lot of things, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to the directed acyclic graph, which is my favorite graph because it's easy. Okay, before we leave into the realm of really weird data structures, which are all my favorites, so I threw them in this talk, are there any questions about graphs or trees? Yes, go ahead. So, uh, graphs aren't really for storing data and recalling them. That's more to understand how each node is related to the other. Mm -hmm. like you wouldn't store just generic data in a graph. You would not store generic data in a graph where the data does not have a network-like structure. Okay. So just storing data, you probably want a list that you can search through in order, or a map that gives you a key value or an index uh, pattern for lookup. Graphs are all about structure, as well with trees. The whole idea is my data has some inherent structure to it, right? The electric lines in this room are a big network, right? They come off of those plugs, they run off to these various things. That's a graph because the structure is important. So one thing that data structures can bring us is actually representing the structure between the data and not just the raw data. Because you can save a graph to a file, right? Michael, here's his list of friends. Lynn, here's her list of friends, etc. right? But that's not easy to traverse because if you want to see if Michael and Lynn have a friend in common, you then have to search through all of Michael's friends, search through all of Land's friends, do this end by end comparison, where a graph gives you that structure of here's, here's, are there any lines going from Land to friend to Michael that actually show up? Now, how to actually do those traversals and calculations is a huge thing in uh, algorithms development these days. So there are lots of different things. Dijkstra's algorithm is all about this. 
it helps you solve the traveling salesman problem, which is how can I order these nodes in the most efficient way? There's lots of theory behind it, but really what graphs bring you are inherent structure. Networks represent really well as graphs because graphs store the structure as part of the, the data model itself rather than leaving you to infer that from the raw bytes. Does that make sense? Okay, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Sets. Sets. As a data structure. Yes, no. I don't have sets in here. <laughs> Question mark. So, Len is asking about sets. Sets are wonderful. They're lists, except you can't have replicated items. So they're kind of a subset, pardon the pun, of lists. <laughs> it's effectively a list that doesn't have repeated elements and also usually defines enough functions that you can do cool things like unions and intersections and all of that. But really, most of the time, I've seen them implemented as lists with extra checks in the insertion call to make sure you're not replicating data. Does that answer your question? So I think when I got the training in computer science about abstract data types and data structures, it was always with this concept that we have data that we're defining some rules on how we can insert data into this structure, how we can search through the structure to find our data, and how we can remove data from the structure. And so um, I guess I, I kind of wanted to hear more about that as opposed to just the data structure being, this is what it looks like, this is what it's good for. Right, so that would be a great follow-up talk called Implementing Data Structures, which I specifically chose not to talk about today because I wanted to get through an overview of things like, oh, I can go to the Java library and I know I want to look for this type because it does this with these special features and you can just pull off the stock uh, representations. I agree implementation of data structures is a great talk, but it's really complicated. It wasn't into. about implementing it. It was more like my concept of a data structure is it's this way of organizing the data that you have special rules about how you can access it. And so in the, in the concept of a stack, your special rule is you can, can only pick up off the top of the stack. And they even have a special terminology for it, which is pop it off the, the stack. So I always have associated it with both how you organize the data and how you're allowed to interact with it. Sure. I specifically made the choice not to cover that information in this talk because I was trying to get through a large number of data structures at once. I've always viewed that as kind of the implementation side of data structures, but I agree that would be a great follow-up talk and we can happily schedule that because data structures, well, there's lots of them and there's lots of things you can discuss. If you have specific questions about what Lan was talking about for the data structures we've defined today, grab me after the meeting because I'm happy to answer those questions. I just don't have slides prepared for it because I always naturally assume or viewed that as data structures too. Anyway, any other questions? No, great. So now we're going into the esoteric style data structures, which are kind of my favorite because they're the really wacky stuff that you just kind of see fall out of the woodwork and you're like, oh, that's a good idea. So, onto my favorite data structure wow. in the entire world. It's a ring buffer. So, <laughs> a I ring buffer is your list, but it's wrapped around in on itself, so, is it a, so it has a finite amount of memory that you use. In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight items in our ring buffer. You don't get more. So if you need to add an item, you pop the tail around the ring once, and your list is a little bit bigger. If you run out of space, you can't add data until you move the head down. So a ring data structure is really great when you need memory efficient storage of your data. I use this in embedded systems all the time because I'm reading in chunks of bytes, and I don't want to define more memory than I absolutely have to have. So I take my array of bytes, and I call it a ring buffer, and I read data in and around a circle, and as data is read out of that circle, the head moves this way, the tail moves this way, and I can take that same block of memory and just overwrite it as many times as I need. As long as the head is moving <coughs> forward faster than the tail is moving around, we have space to store our data. So it's a concise way of storing a small amount of, or storing an infinite amount of data in a set amount of space with the potentiality that you could overflow the buffer and then you get an error. Yes? So I, I wanted to mention that because I also work at the same place as you, this is exactly what we see with our data on the satellites. 
And so we've had experiences in the past where um, um, the data is being collected on a ring buffer, and your goal is to get that data off of the ring buffer before it has a chance to over, overwrite any data that you're collecting. And so anytime that we have issues trying to talk to our spacecraft, we run the risk of losing data. So real world applications. Yes, this is exactly what I use it for, is data in an embedded system, which in my case <coughs> is a satellite. Now, some of you may be wondering, why use this data structure if you're going to just have that chance of overwrapping it and lose data? Well, the answer is because the alternative of just having infinite amount of memory taken up with your data can crash your spacecraft and have it fall out of the sky in flames. So, ring buffers put a hard limit on how much memory you can use to store your data. Yes, you have to be quick about getting it off, but the alternative is potentially crashing your spacecraft. Yeah, go ahead. Like data older than a certain number of hours isn't going to be useful anyway. Sure. That's another feature of the ring buffer, which is why I like it, is the oldest data gets overwritten first. So you started here, this is where you're inserting data, right? Well, you're just going to go overwrite the head. And guess what? You lose data that is eight <coughs> cycles old. Not as important as the stuff I just wrote. So, Ring buffer allows you to manage data in a fixed amount of space so that you don't have the potential of overflowing memory, overflowing stack, running out of space, when you have conceivably an infinite amount of data coming in, like you've got a little sensor that's just constantly producing data. You want to capture most of that data, but you don't want the sensor that is, say, collecting wind speed to destroy your entire aircraft. Ring buffers. Put limits on memory so that you can capture an infinite amount of data in finite amount of space without all the problems that generally come there. Slip lists. This is something we were discussing at the Love last week. It's another one of my favorites because I used it at work. The idea behind a slip list is it looks like a map, but if you index between keys, you slip to the next record, and that's your value. So this is a good way of getting values that are close to your key without going over. You know, the old Bob Barker from um, Price is Right, right? You index between keys, you slip to the next one. You don't get the last one that's gone over, you just in, out, right? So if you ask a map or your dictionary for a key that it doesn't have, you always get a decent result. It's a way of giving your indexed value store a little bit of fuzziness. So it can produce a result that is close, and you don't have to have specific um, keys for every conceivable record. Where I find I use this most often is when my key is a floating point. So if you have a floating point, the chances of you being in, able to index into a map and getting the exact right value out, crazy small. Because floating points are all kind of wishy-washy and they represent real numbers, which are all super wishy-washy. With a slip list, you can index in, and it will slip to the nearest record that you actually have, so you get something close, and you don't have to have exact accuracy. If you want to know more, I believe there are slip lists in the Java Standard Library. So you can go look there. And let's see, I think I have one more. Oh, directed acyclic graphs. So this is the graph that I was alluding to earlier. Directed acyclic graphs are graphs that have direction and no cycles. You can't go around in a loop, you just have one direction. This is great because it helps you do things like dependency management. It's effectively a forest, which is a bunch of trees superimposed on top of each other. It's great because you can enter here and you can follow the graph to get all of the children, but also enter here and follow to get all of its children. So you have a tree with multiple root nodes. This is great for dependency management. Because if node 1 depends on node 2 and node 3, and these depend on these, and these depend on these, you can just walk the graph to get your dependencies in order. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It makes it super efficient to grab an ordered subset of your dependencies. Now the problem is, what happens if you have a cycle? This is why they're directed acyclic graphs as opposed to directed cyclic graphs. You come down here, go here, go here, go here, go here, and you're just traversing this tree forever because it's now no longer a cyclic. And so you go in the cycle and get trapped, and then your computer program generally throws an error and says, hey, we can't do this. So some of you may have remembered uh, me talking about CMake earlier. 
CMake is great because you can say, for each item in my library, I define these dependencies. And as long as your dependencies represent a directed acyclic graph, CMake rolls them all up and puts them in order so that you don't have to figure out, do I link this first or this first? This first or this first? Linking is actually constructing the executable from C++ code. And it's the biggest pain in the neck to get all of those things ordered right. With a directed acyclic graph, that order just falls out of the data structure on your feet. Cool? Cool. I think we're getting pretty close to the end of my talk. The last thing to discuss is big O notation. I was yes. going to mention the other place that you'll see directed acyclic sure. graphs is distributed version control. So if you're using something like Git or Mercurial at the back end, representing all of those commits is a directed acyclic graph. You don't want cyclic graphs representing your dependency, or not your dependencies, your commits, because then your commit history has a cycle in it and it just goes around and around forever. Cycles are bad when you're trying to do depth first searches to get ordering da ordered data out. So a directed acyclic graph is your get structure because you can branch and get these multiple streams of execution, but they're all going in the same direction and there aren't allowed to be cycles. Make sense? Yeah, go ahead. So I talk, I've often heard the term Merkle directed acyclic graph used uh, a lot with EGs. Do you want um, to be able to explain it? I can't because I've not heard that term before. Okay. So that's something I will have to look up or we can discuss offline. Anybody else? Cool. It's something for us to solve and bring back to the next meeting. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about is big O notation. So big O notation is what I view as the prep to what Len was suggesting that we would discuss today, which is efficiency and how do we look at inserting and um, taking data out of each of these data structures and what are the costs. So it's kind of looking at the next talk, but I wanted to give you a crash course on this so that you have it in your back pocket. Now, often I've seen in computer science classes all over the place, they make big O notation look terrible. It's the most scary thing in the world because they put all this math and talk about all this complicated stuff and really the result is simple. Big O notation is telling you in terms of time, how long does it take? Is it constant with the number of data structures uh, or data items in, in your uh, data structure? Is it logarithmic? Does it grow linearly? Um, quadratically? Exponentially? So, that's the scary part. This is the easy part. Here's your graph, right? If it's constant, it stays low and constant, no matter how many items you put in our data structure. If it's that n log n thing, it's slightly better, but not terrible. If you're getting into linear, here's your linear curve there. Lots of people like linear algorithms and data structures that give you linear performance, because at least it grows constantly. As you move past linear, you hit quadratic, uh, sorry, quadratic is over here, you have n log n here. It's a graph. Look towards infinity. That will show you if your data structure is really inefficient because it grows really fast, or if it's really efficient and it grows very slowly. You want to try to stay, if you're worried about space, you want to make sure your space complexity stays low. If you're worried about time, you want to make sure your time complexity stays low. Knowing that if you worry, if you keep one low, the other is probably growing up here because you have to put this complexity somewhere. That's big O notation. It's just looking down these graphs and saying, what happens when I have a lot of data structures or data elements in my data structure? If you have a billion things running in an n log n, sorry, an n to the n data structure, it grows really fast. And after like four items, your code takes hours to run. If you have a billion things in a constant, um, constant time structure, it runs immediately because it's constant time. It'll take the same amount of time no matter how much you put in it. And there's a gradient between the two. Any questions on this? I'm hoping this is pretty simple and not scary. That was my goal. Can you go back to the slide? Say again? This? So these are actual <laughs> mathematical notations behind those graphs. And this is what tended to scare my computer science classes. They saw all of this math and logs. They're like, this is terrifying. And really, it's just, which one of these lines grows the fastest? Avoid them. So you don't want an n to the n to the n 
data structure, you want a constant, or as close to constant as you can get. Any other questions? Yes. So I was going to mention that um, this actually affected me on one of my projects because at work we were running some code and I didn't know how long ago it took to run. I was just thinking, it seems unreasonable that this, this process is taking 11 hours to run. And I kept pointing that out to people. They eventually looked at it and they said, no, we benchmarked this before. It usually takes like under two hours to run. And so we went to the developer and they said, okay, what's the difference between this code and this code? And based on that, they were able to find like the part of their code that was causing our our runtime to increase like it's like two hours to thirteen, just a lot. Big O notation is helpful for preventing you from shooting yourself in the foot when you test on small items. If you test on a list of four items, no matter how terrible your algorithm is or how terrible your data structure is, it's going to run fast. When you increase to a billion items, that's when you see problems. Big O notation is a way of looking ahead and saying, as this thing gets more and more data, it's going to take more and more time based on this. Is this reasonable or not reasonable? Reasonable is linear and better. Not reasonable tends to be above linear, although sometimes you can avoid quadratics. The other thing to note is, remember when I was talking about those reading those Python bytes and it was taking like, minutes to read a small text file? Yeah, it's because their big old complexity was terrible. They were testing on like five byte sets, and yeah, so making 10 copies of every byte and passing it all around was fine. But the as the number of data expanded, you ended up with, I think it was a quadratic function of memory, because you had every data structure created that number of replicants of it, which is why the process slowed down. So I can tell you from big O notation that that's the issue with the program before I've even dug through the code and actually looked at why they're doing it this way. Cool. Yes? Um, I know you kind of talked about it, you mentioned invariance, but I guess just to clarify, is Big O talking about on average or worst case? Uh, now you're asking the tough questions. So there are multiple <laughs> variants of this. There's Big O, Big Theta, Big Omega, and Little O, Little Theta, and little omega. The little ones are um, the little ones are under bounds. So your algorithm will run no better than the little variants of these. Big O's, big theta, big omega are the upper bounds. You generally want the upper bounds because they tell you worst case. Now, uh, big O, I believe, is the worst case um, runtime of your program. So. This is what will happen in the worst case of your program. Uh, big omega is the middle case, the average case, and big theta, I think, is the best case performance. But for most data structures, the best case performance is constant time, and so it's not really great. So that's why we talk about big O, is it represents the worst case. So if all of your data is distinctly non-optimal, it will run in at least this time. Does that make sense? That got really complicated really fast. Yes? How do you compute big O? Is it, can you do it theoretically, or does it have to be benchmark? It's based on, yeah, the, there was a power disruption. Um, big O is calculated generally using a few standard patterns. So if you're running once through your data with a single for loop, that's linear. If you have a for loop inside a for loop, that's quadratic. For loop inside for loop inside for loop is uh, cubic. So that's kind of how you get the basic polynomial, linear, quadratic, and cubic. Constant time is no loops, and n to the n is you have uh, a loop that for every item in the loop runs through the entire record itself. That's how you get n, no, that's cubic. I forget how you get n to the end, which is pretty terrible. You have to work pretty hard to get it into the end <laughs> complexity graph. Now, some of you might have been saying, hey, there were logs in there. You're not talking about logs. Well, the logs come from things like your binary search. The big O of binary search is n log n, which means it's just a little worse than linear, but it is better than quadratic. Whereas if you just had a pool of data, you'd have a quadratic search. For every item, search every item, dot. 
With your binary search, you get n log n, which is considerably more efficient at the long end because you're cutting the problem in half. That's where the log comes from. It's a log base two, not necessarily uh, uh, a natural or a 10 base log. So it sounds like you can at least identify which of the big O's your search or whatever it falls under, but like actually measuring it. That would... Knowing the exact, we always talk about um, orders of magnitude in big O. You never say it's exactly this. You just say it's O of linear or O of quadratic. And you can guess pretty close based on for loops alone. If, and then to get to the more logarithmic areas, you have to kind of know the algorithm that's running and whether or not they have the right if statements in there to break out early. But in general, for those of you who are wondering how do I apply this today, look through your code. If you've got a for loop, that's big O of linear, that's pretty good. If you have a for loop with a for loop inside, that's quadratic, that's the, that's bad but not terrible. If you have a for loop inside of a for loop inside of a for loop, that's cubic, and you really ought to think of refactoring that code to try to get the number of nested for loops down. Because each time you jump into another for loop that's hiding inside a for loop, that's another order of complexity. So in practice, what I look at for big O is, is it linear, quadratic, cubic, or something worse? I don't go into the logarithmics unless I have a quadratic and it's not good enough. My quadratic is still running too slow for the problem I'm solving, and then I start looking at binary searches and cutting that down. But for a first pass, its number of nested for loops falls out into this structure pretty quickly. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Cool. Based on Lance's comments, I think we'll probably need a data structure too, which starts pulling apart some of these lists and maps into how do you insert how do you remove, what is the contract, and what are the implementation level details that give you the efficiency that we were talking about? Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Foundations, who's your favorite author on this? Foundations, who's Foundational data structures. I had a terrible data structure book when I was going to school. I can't remember my data structure book from when I was going to school. You have a favorite, any. I don't have a favorite. Most of this is gleaned from what I remember in college and what I've used in practice in the workplace. Hence, a lot of this high-level survey stuff. I wanted to hit the high points of what I've seen in my career so that other people will run into similar problems. Because, like, what Len brought up of what's the contract for inserting and removing stuff in your data structure, I've found in practice, at least with the Java data structures, they all define every contract. So a list will support a queue and a stack and a uh, and an array. They all have all of the contracts available to you. So an idea of kind of the types that exist out there give you a lot of information on where they can be useful. Like uh, Canoe, for example, that's foundational. Yeah, but very hard to do. Yeah. So I think that the, the issue is that many of us learning or revisiting it these days are just looking at online resources. Right. Whatever's out there that suddenly speaks to us and say, oh, I can use this in my lecture. Stack Overflow. <laughs> you guys laugh. I'm on Stack Overflow as a professional engineer every day. Half the time it's looking up syntax because I switch languages about four times a day. And half the time it's, I know this thing exists, I know what the right answer is, I just need someone to connect this dot quickly so I don't have to think too hard. Which sounds terrible, but it makes me more efficient at my job that I can look something up. And that's not necessarily, yeah? You guys okay guys, you okay? I think we're okay. Um, the, the presentation is about to wrap up. Um, so, when we get to things like design patterns and algorithms, I have books that I can recommend there. They're textbooks, they're the pretty standard textbooks, but I've used them and they're rock solid. Um, the design patterns book, which is the blue one, I don't remember who wrote it, but it's the blue one with the white cover. The Gang of Four. The Gang of Four book. I've used that several times, pulled it off my shelf, and I'm just like, that's what I need. Read this one section. It's like a manual of data structures. Sorry, data design patterns. I don't have a data structure version for that. Any other questions? And that's a good question. I will try to remember that the next time I present to come with literature that I can recommend. Anyone else? Well, Okay. I was going to recommend that if you start going down that route, a lot of people are going to use GitHub, 
to kind of start collecting or crowdsourcing like, the, the foundational like uh, references that help other people study this stuff. Uh, my meetup group has been trying to put together a compendium of resources. And one backlog item has been data structure. So if we get if we get that together, I'll be sure. Cool. Yeah, I highly recommend looking at online resources because if you have a book that's kind of static, at least these people are are teaching you things on YouTube or through animations or through like an article, and somehow reading it in those different formats sometimes makes the connection spark. Yeah, go ahead and say for a sort of beginner, the presentation was great, um, and sort of more coverage. Uh, a fewer algorithms is um, the Harvard CS50 course. Uh, the lectures from that are kind of hour long. It goes in the binary search and like pulls up ten students on on stage and like it's it's very good. Um, welcome to Gallup. Yes, I will back that up. There are lots of resources that go into every conceivable shadow and corner of everything I've just presented. All of these data structures that I pulled up. There are courses that are available online, books and online resources that will tell you every detail of the implementation, which is a reason why I try to keep it general, because I find most of the time, if I have a wide ocean of knowledge, I know enough to find the resource I need for the implementation. If I just know the implementations, which is how I came out of college, then I don't know that I'm missing things like ring buffers. They didn't teach us ring buffers in college. I would have never known they were there until I ran into one in the wild, and I'm like, hey, this is a good idea. I never overflow my memory. Yeah. One thing ring buffers use for is machine tools. Yeah. Where you're calculating uh, where, to move, where to move to next. Yeah. If you have a ring buffer with 32 moves, in, and if there's less than 32 moves, then you calculate the next move. Yeah. Embedded systems love ring buffers because embedded systems tend to struggle with memory and tend to shy away from creating new memory objects with dynamic memory. So you tend to get static memory pools that you can you know, control over. And ring buffers give you very good control over your memory without needing any extra space, which is why we like that. And it's why it's my new favorite data structure, because I use them all the time. They're kind of a beast to implement to get everything right, but they're not any worse than that. Yes, we can pull the audience to do that the Sure. Anybody interested in uh, basic data structures, contracts, and implementation? Yes, go. Okay. <laughs> so, what data structure do you want to start with? I'm happy to talk about this all night, so don't don't test me. I <laughs> I need more on trees because I kind of stopped the binary trees and all the other trees are just like I zoned out. Well, for anyone who needs to leave, do you need to explain the check situation? Okay, I'll send you. What is the check situation? Uh, if everybody can please uh, make sure to pay for their items on the way out because otherwise. Uh, Michael will get stuff with you. Yeah. <laughs> so tell them I ordered this, how much do I owe you? And just remember to factor in so, tax and 10%. For those of you who are confused, it sounds like the venue got confused and will give us a single uh, order that we all have to pay out from. So as you go out, stop by the front desk and say, I ordered this. It's for the group in the back. I would like to pay for it. And they'll just continually knock it down. And then the last person to leave goes. <laughs> so, to be last. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, do us that solid and pay for your stuff on the way out. Usually we get separate checks, but this may not necessarily been the most understood by us as we move here. It's our first time here, so we didn't really know a lot about being here, and some of the nuances didn't be here. So, we'll have to deal with it tonight, and that's that. Any other questions? Great oh, thank you. So we'll throw the follow-on into the queue. Um, we can talk about trees if you'd like. I 
paid enough attention through trees that I know where to start researching, but I don't know the implementation and contractual guarantees of trees off the top of my head because my head was kind of more big in that class a little bit. In, in college, data structures was the course at my college, which was the weeder course. We're going to make it as hard as possible so people who don't deserve to be in our program are out. <laughs> Yeah, not necessarily the type of class you want for your data structures. On the other hand, operating systems was not a weeder course, so I understand operating systems very well because it was balanced for the amount of credits that you got. So you did the work, you did fine. It is what it is. Anyway, thank you for your time. I hope you learned something. I will be up here eating my dinner for a while. If you have questions, come ask because I love talking about this stuff. If you have suggestions for the group, Slack or email or meet up us or come chat with us now. And I'm going to stop talking so you all can enjoy the evening.